In this lesson, we're learning how to classify matter into different types. Now, perhaps you've learned in other uh, studies and in other uh, disciplines about how things can be classified. In geology, rocks can be classified in certain ways. Stars and galaxies can be classified in different ways. Well, on our planet, we classify matter into one of three things. Now, matter, basically, before we go any further, everything that's matter has mass, or it can be weight on a scale, in other words, and it takes up space. It has a certain volume to it. And all matter is made up of atoms. Now, when we say atoms, uh, we're talking about these very tiny uh, building blocks of matter. We'll talk more about that in this course. Everything that we uh, have in the world can be classified as either an element, a compound, or a mixture. And so hopefully by the end of this lesson, you'll be able to take anything that's given to you, any, uh, any uh, material, and say if it's an element, a compound, or a mixture. Well, let's start with the first type, and that would be the simplest type of matter, which would be elements. Now, we say that they're the simplest form of matter because elements have only one type of atom. And so that's why we can say that elements are the purest form of matter as well. They're the purest and the simplest. And so if you have an element like uh, gold, for example, if you look at those, uh, those atoms of gold, well, they're basically just gold atoms, just one type of atom. If it's truly pure, there should not be any uh, atoms of other elements in there, if it truly is a, a, a pure element. Now, when we say atoms, this is a, just a graphical representation of what we're talking about. This is the idea of an atom having a nucleus in the middle with protons and neutrons, and then there are electrons uh, buzzing around that nucleus. Uh, we'll talk more about what atoms are like in an upcoming lesson. Now, when we say elements, there really aren't that many in the whole world. In fact, if we look at the periodic table, well, this is a listing of all the elements that exist in nature. And honestly, there are only about 90 elements that exist in our natural world. And so everything that's made in our, our world is essentially made of these 90 uh, building blocks. Now, if you look at a current periodic table, you'll notice that there are more than 90 elements. You might notice that there are uh, at least 118 elements that have been discovered up to up to this point. Um, those other 28 elements have been made in labs, and so they're synthetic elements. You're not going to find them in nature, but they do exist, and they've been created uh, in, in laboratories. So when we say periodic table, this is what we're talking about, this uh, chart. If you're in a, in, in, in a chemistry classroom, you've probably seen this periodic table before. And this is going to be one of the focuses, or one of the uh, most important things that we're going to focus on in this chemistry course. Now, when we say that they're simplest, they're also simplest in the way that we can't separate them into anything simpler. So if you have something that is gold, pure gold, well, you can't separ separate it and make it somehow simpler. You know, it is, it is the simplest. So basically, the first bullet and the last here are, are kind of saying the same thing. Now well, let's talk about the next complex, or the, the next most complex type of matter, which would be compounds. Now compounds are when we have a chemical fusion of different elements. And so to have a compound, you have to have two or more elements chemically fused together. Now it is possible to separate a compound into simpler elements, but you can only do this by means of a chemical reaction. And so since in a compound, the atoms are fused together chemically, you can only separate them chemically. So for example, if we have uh, different compounds like some of these here, sugar, water, salt, aspirin, you know, drugs, uh, we know that you can separate these into their component elements. So for example, this is a, uh, a visual representation of a water molecule. We know the formula for water is H2O. And so that means it has two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. And so here the red circle is oxygen and we have two white circles and those are, e those are each hydrogen. Now you can take water and separate it into its component elements, hydrogen and oxygen, but you have to have a chemical reaction. 
And so the most common way to do this is to run a current of electricity through that water. And it can be done pretty easily using something as simple as a 9 volt battery. And you can take uh, water and separate it out into um, hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, or, and uh, you can see those, those component elements. Um, this is a process called electrolysis. Now, if you're not sure if something is a compound, ask yourself, does it have a chemical formula? Now, all these things we have here listed have chemical formulas. So, for example, sugar, just the regular sugar that you put on your cereal in the morning, uh, has the formula C12H22O11. And so that's a, a much more complex formula than, say, water, but that's its formula. Water, of course, is H2O. Salt is in a crystal form, and this is the formula of uh, a, uh, a unit of salt, NaCl. And that's what a crystal of salt looks like if you were to look at its atoms. Uh, then we have other compounds. Here's a drug that is used by many people, caffeine. And so this is a, a representation of its molecular structure as well. So that's caffeine found in sodas and coffee and things like that. And aspirin. Aspirin is a compound. It has a formula. Its formula happens to be C9H8O4. In fact, every uh, compound has a distinct formula. Uh, most drugs, we, we talked about caffeine. Some people take ibuprofen. Uh, you've heard of uh, naproxen. Uh, these are drugs. Uh, there are other drugs, uh, pharmaceuticals. They all have chemical formulas that make some compounds. Now, when we talk about compounds and elements together, those are considered to be pure substances. And so, can you ask yourself, uh, is oxygen a substance? Well, yes, it is, because it's an element. If it's an element, it's a substance. What about water? Is water a substance? Well, yes, it is, because it's a compound. Now, how about a computer? Is a computer a substance? Well, it's not, because it's not a compound or an element. A computer is basically a mixture of several different substances. The only thing that in, in chemistry we can call substances or, or pure substances are things that are compounds or elements. Now, speaking of mixtures, let's talk about uh, those briefly here. Mixtures are physical blends of two or more substances. And so earlier we said that compounds are chemically fused together. Well, mixtures are physically mixed together or physically blended together. And so as a result, since they're physically blended, you can separate them by physical means. And here in a few uh, minutes we'll talk about how we actually separate mixtures. And so you can separate a mixture, or, or rather we can talk about two types of mixtures, homogeneous mixtures and heterogeneous mixtures. Now homogeneous mixtures are uniform in their composition. That means that if you look at a homogeneous mixture, it's got the same composition all the way through it. And so one of the best examples I can give you would be this stuff right here, Kool-Aid. And so if you've ever made Kool-Aid, you know that it has uh, water in it. You know that you have to put some sugar in there. And then you have to put the Kool-Aid mix in there, which is basically uh, a few other compounds. Uh, there's a little citric acid in there, uh, some other items, a couple of uh, dyes in there. And we'll call that the mix. And so we have several different compounds in Kool-Aid. And if you mix it together and you drink the the bottle or the, the glass of Kool-Aid, you know that the Kool-Aid at the very top of the, of, the, of the jug should taste the very same as it does at the bottom of the jug. That's because it's homogeneous. It's uniform all the way through. And if for some reason it doesn't taste the same all the way through the jug, then that means you've mixed it wrong. And so homogeneous mixtures are, are uniform all the way through. Now on the other form, or on the other hand, heterogeneous mixtures are not uniform all the way through. And so here's an example of a heterogeneous mixture. And this is a salad. 
And so if you look at that salad, you can see that there are different parts of that salad. You can see the parts with the naked eye. And that's what makes it heterogeneous, if you can see the different parts with your eye. Now, the different parts of a heterogeneous mixture are called phases. And so, for example, in your salad, we might say that there's a phase of lettuce. And then there's another phase of croutons. And there's a phase of tomatoes. And there's a phase of ranch dressing. This is very simplified, but hopefully you, you, you get the idea. When we talk about phases, we're talking about the different visible parts of a heterogeneous mixture. Now, homogeneous mixtures like Kool-Aid and other things like that are often called solutions. Now, solutions like uh, Kool-Aid are probably uh, most commonly thought of of being mainly in, in, uh, in the liquid state uh, with other solids or things dissolved in there. They're not always that way though. There are certain types of solutions called alloys that are primarily solids. So if you think of alloys like steel and bronze and pewter and things like that, those are solutions also, even though they're primarily in the solid state. Steel has the, the same composition all the way through the, the chunk of steel. Maybe you can think of a, a gaseous solution also. I'm thinking of air as a homogeneous mixture that's primarily in the gas state. And so air is a solution because it's got uh, a uniform composition all the way through. Normally the air at the top of the room is 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen, just like it is at the bottom of the room. Let's talk about a few ways to separate some mixtures. Uh, one common way is just by simple physical means. And so uh, what that means is just separating the pieces out. So if you have a salad, you can separate out the faces just by uh, picking them apart. If you don't like cucumbers in your salad, well, you can just uh, pick them out. You can separate it pretty easily. Uh, sometimes you have to use some ingenious ways. If you were to have a mixture of, oh, let's say iron filings along with some confetti, and you had to separate those two things, you might use the fact that iron is magnetic and run a magnet over this mixture to separate those two things. And that's a physical way of separating a mixture also. So you might use a magnet in that case. Another way that we separate mixtures is by distillation. Now this is an example of a distillation apparatus here. This is where we have a mixture and we use heat to separate those things. So this is kind of a, a very simplistic uh, picture there, but maybe you can imagine that in in this, uh, in this flask over here on the left side, we have a mixture of, let's say, let's just say alcohol and water, just for argument's sake. And this is sometimes done in the lab to demonstrate distillation. Now, alcohol has a boiling point of about 78 degrees Celsius, whereas alcohol, or rather water, has a boiling point of about 100 degrees Celsius. So if you could take this flask of solution over here and heat it up to say, oh, let's say about 85 degrees Celsius, somewhere in that neighborhood. Well, hopefully you see that the alcohol is going to boil away. And so it's going to float up here in its vapor phase, and it's going to go along here along this tube, and we're going to have alcohol vapor. Well, if we run some cold water along the outside part of this condensing tube here, that's what this is called, well, you can recondense that alcohol vapor. And so down here on the other end, you'll get some liquid alcohol that drips out on the other side. So you can purify the solution that way. Now it's not completely pure because water does evaporate at 85 degrees Celsius. In fact, it evaporates at room temperature too. So if you repeat this process, you can purify it a little bit more. So eventually you can purify uh, alcohol or any other solution using distillation. So this is sometimes called a still or a, a distillation apparatus. And it's sometimes used to purify water. If you do this and you have water on the other end here, we call that distilled water. Now another way to separate mixtures is by chromatography. And this is where we take a long uh, tube of some kind and we inject a solution up at the top of there, usually it's a very small amount, 
and we take advantage of the fact that the different substances will fall through that column at different rates. And so you might have a uh, mixture with, let's say, three uh, substances in there. We'll just abbreviate that. And maybe substance number one falls through this tube very quickly and pops out first, and you can see that. And then maybe uh, 20 seconds later, substance number two pops out the end, and you can see that. And then maybe a minute or so later, substance number three pops out the end. And so you can separate a mixture, or at least small amounts of a mixture, using chromatography. This is often used uh, to separate the mixtures of uh, liquids or dyes or things like that. And so hopefully you're able to see how mixtures are separated. Now looking at this entire lesson, at this point you should be able to take almost anything and determine whether it's an element, a compound, or a mixture. And if it's a mixture, is it homogeneous or heterogeneous? Well, let's take a look at a summary here. If we look at all matter, we can classify all matter, all matter as either pure substances or mixtures. And substances are either elements or compounds. And of course, elements can't be separated into anything simpler. Compounds can be separated into something simpler, but only by chemical means. Mixtures can be either heterogeneous or homogeneous, and we see some ways that we can separate those. So let's see if we uh, have learned anything in this lesson. Is it an element, a compound, or a mixture? So how about nickel? Well, that's found on the periodic table. So it is an element. How about a cheeseburger? Well, it is a mixture. And hopefully, you realize that it is also a heterogeneous mixture because you could very easily see the different parts of the cheeseburger. You can see the bread, you can see the, the meat, and you can pick that apart if you want to. How about sodium fluoride? Well, this is a chemical fusion of two or more elements, so this would be called a compound. How about orange juice? Well, as it turns out, this is a mixture, and it's also a heterogeneous mixture because all true orange juice has at least a little bit of orange pulp in it. In fact, we know this because if you look at the side of the jug of orange juice, it says, shake well before serving. So that's one of the ways we know that this is a heterogeneous mixture. How about sugar? Well, that's a compound. We know it has a formula. We talked about its formula earlier. How about lithium? That's a, an element. It's element number three on the periodic table. What about the ocean? Well, that's a mixture as well, and it's heterogeneous because it may have a fish swimming in it, it may have uh, something else, seaweed, and so taken as, basically as a whole, the ocean is a heterogeneous mixture. What about milk? It's also a mixture. Now, the milk that you buy at the store is actually homogeneous. It's been homogenized. But if you were to take milk uh, straight out of the cow, raw milk, or out of an animal, it would actually be heterogeneous. So it actually could be either one based upon which milk you're thinking of. So at this point, you should be able to, to determine if pretty much anything is an element, a compound, or a mixture.